India is not really a country. India is more like a never-ending continent full of amazing things to explore and huge challenges to overcome every step of the way. This is a story of how I rode 8,000 kilometers pretty much all around the country, from the very north to the very south to the many places in between. This was by far the most challenging motorbike trip I had ever done in my entire life. Yet at the same time, it was incredibly rewarding. This is how it looked. When we landed in India, we spent the first two weeks in and around Delhi, eating its famous street foods, getting to know the local life and giving away my sponsor's money to feed a few hundred people in the local slums. Then we rented two motorbikes and it was finally time to start our motorbike trip. There was only one problem though, my filmmaker Andrus did not know how to ride a bike. So we went to a random parking lot somewhere in the city where I spent the next few hours teaching him the ins and outs of riding a mechanical bike. When it got dark, we couldn't sit around any longer and had to move. How are you feeling, bro? <laughs> Not like a pro. <laughs> Not yet. I really hope it's gonna work out. Oh my god. And so, with our self-confidence at a pretty decent low, but excitement at a real high, we finally hit the busy night streets of India, not really knowing where the road will take us. Eventually, very late at night, we arrived to our first hotel of the trip. We finally arrived to our place. We only have a couple of hours to sleep now, um, so I guess we'll, we'll hit the bed. <sighs> no. We wanted to wake up for, for uh, sunrise and be the first people um, to be allowed to get into the Taj Mahal. Yes, that's right. The first destination of our trip was none other but the Taj Mahal, one of the renowned seven wonders of the world. We went inside the Taj Mahal at exactly 6 a.m. on Monday morning, and even though we certainly didn't enjoy the massive crowds, we pushed through them and admired this wonderful wonder of the world that was built by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his wife Montaz in the early 17th century. Look at all the details, all the all the tiny bricks, all the ornaments and everything. It's just, just next level epic. As you can probably tell, the Taj Mahal is considered to be the greatest architectural achievement in the whole range of Indo-Islamic architecture due to its perfect harmony and excellent craftsmanship. Witnessing it firsthand, I couldn't have agreed more. Then it was time to hit the road again, but this time the roads were a little bit more interesting than the highways we took last night. Um, take a look. The next morning we found ourselves in the ancient city of Orcha that was so beautiful and untouched by mass tourism, we could hardly believe it. Man, this place is incredible! I'm currently sitting at the top of the fortress and from here I can see literally the whole thing. All the temples, all the palaces, uh, the markets and everything. So basically, this place is very small, you can walk everywhere you want. Uh, it's, it's not busy at all, there's very very few tourists, only the local people, which makes me very very happy. <laughs> You see, Orcha was established in the early 16th century as the seat of one of the many princely states of central India of those times and was so rich that it even built a palace for the Mughal emperor who came to visit the town for just one night. These days the amazing complexes built by the royalty of those times have been mostly abandoned and only visited by tourists, but one can certainly imagine the grandeur in which those people lived just a few hundred years ago. Man, just look at this place. This is just one of the many temples here in Orcha. Completely empty, kind of abandoned, which makes it incredibly beautiful. And we have the whole thing to ourselves. The sun is already setting. Look at the whole thing. <laughs> it's insane. As you can imagine, we certainly didn't waste any time in this gorgeous place and explored literally everything we could. I'm at the very, very top of one of the highest temples in all of Orcha. That's the very top right there. That's me. The view from here is so incredible, it's crazy. Look at the sunset. Nice. <laughs>
The next morning we were back on the road enjoying the beautiful views around us while also trying to avoid the local cows casually crossing the road whenever they felt like it. For sunset we stopped to admire a gorgeous local temple and rode further late into the night trying to reach our next destination. But it wasn't meant to be. My bike completely ran out of fuel. Anders still hasn't but it probably will in, in, in a few hundred meters. So now I'm gonna hop on his bike try to find some sort of a tiny settlement or village and see where life takes us basically yeah and i'll just chill here for a bit yeah listen to some music nice. and hope no tigers will come nice hope this works and so andrews chilled completely alone in the middle of a dense jungle while i found some epic local people who agreed to help us out okay uh, <laughs> yes. Eventually managed to fill up our tanks and continued riding. But our struggles apparently didn't end there since the roads were absolutely terrible and it was pitch black dark. What's up with this road? Everything's completely fine. We're still rolling. A few hours later though, we somehow found a tiny country concrete road and continued riding very late into the night, once again doing our best to avoid the local traffic. We well, finally, finally got back home. It's 1.30 a.m. in the morning, and we're so tired. <laughs> but the ride, the ride was incredible. Oh, man. The next morning, we had a great time refreshing ourselves in a huge waterfall in the area, and finally arrived to central India, which turns out had some really interesting road signs. Welcome to central India. <laughs> uh. Tigers or no tigers, we kept on riding and riding and riding some more. But due to all the mountainous roads and the never-ending construction work, our progress was excruciatingly slow, tiring and messy. Just finished another day of riding and take a look at my t-shirt. <laughs> This morning it was white as snow and now it's not so wet anymore. Oh man, look at my hands as well. <laughs> man, I'm so tired. Oh! But we certainly didn't let any obstacles stop us as there were a million more places we wanted to see. First up, the famous UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Caves of Elora. Elora Caves is a series of 34 magnificent rocket temples in western India. Spread over a distance of 2 kilometers, the temples are one of the largest rocket monastery temple cave complexes in the world featuring Buddhist, Hindu and Jain monuments dating from over a thousand years back. As beautiful as the caves are, apparently uh, they come with a bit of a price. <laughs> One of the coolest things about the caves was the fact that every single cave we went to had amazing intricate sculptures of different gods and deities, as well as very beautiful architecture that left me in awe. We left the caves with the biggest smiles on our faces, but unfortunately, could not have predicted what will happen next. So when we came to the caves, we had to start our bag somewhere. And next to the parking lot, there was a guest house where we asked the receptionist whether we can, you know, leave the bags there in the storage room. He said yes, we paid him some money to look after the bags. When we come back, my, my GoPro action camera is not there. Um, and then I spent a really long time talking with everyone at the hotel, asking them whether anyone knew anything. Uh, everyone, of course, said no, even though, of course, some of them did, because I mean, one of those people stole my camera. I reminded myself that these things are a big part of life, especially on super active road trips just like this one, and happily continued riding down south.
until eventually we reached one of my favorite places in India, Hampi. <laughs> Hampi is a UNESCO World Heritage Site located in southern India. In the 14th century, Hampi was the capital of the Hindu Vijayanagara Empire. It was so prosperous that by the year 1500, Hampi actually became the world's second largest city after Beijing and probably India's richest at that time, attracting traders from all around the world. I first came to India around three years ago and one of the locations I visited during that time was, was, was this place, was, was this exact temple. And it just brings back so many really cool memories. Uh, it looked so different then, I guess, but it was exactly the same place, so incredible. Can't wait to explore. These days, Hampi certainly isn't anywhere near to being the world's second largest city, but rather a tiny touristy village surrounded by loads of amazing ruins that are spread over 4,100 hectares. Oh, also, their nature is incredibly beautiful. So apparently it took us less than two weeks to come to this place, but uh, they were so exhausting because we were driving literally every single day, sometimes up to 12 or 14 hours per day through you know crazy roads and we just got so exhausted. So it feels so good to finally be here in Hampi, which is, which is such a refreshing place, such a beautiful place, such a calm place. And, and I think we'll, we'll take a couple of days off to, to just relax and, and uh, and get ready for, for the other leg of the trip, but uh, it's incredibly beautiful here. Nice. We spent the next few days taking everything in and relaxing as much as we could, and then it was time to get back on the road. <laughs> My boy Andres just got a flat tire. Beautiful. What happened, bro? I don't know. Just a flat tire. <laughs> From nowhere. Life in India. Love it. Let's uh, let's fix it now. As always, all problems in life are generally fixable much faster than you might think. A minute later, I asked for directions on where to find a mechanic, and ten minutes later, we found ourselves chilling with a really friendly Indian family while the father was fixing Andres' bike. Namaste. Namaste. Eventually, the bike got fixed and we once again hit the road, not really knowing where it'll take us. Jacob, where are we going? To the waterfall! We're finally in the parts of India that I really, really, really wanted to explore. Lush green forests, no people whatsoever, mountains all around us, rivers, waterfalls, it's amazing. And right now we're gonna go check out some sort of a really big waterfall here in the area. Apparently the waterfall wasn't much of a sight as it was the driest time of the year. However, the views around us took our breaths away. We just came to the world's second largest Tibetan settlement outside of Tibet in this place. Uh, it doesn't feel like India at all. Yes, you heard that right. We found ourselves in the world's second largest Tibetan settlement outside Tibet that was called Bilakupe. You see, in 1960, the government of the Indian state of Karnataka allotted nearly 3,000 acres of land at Bilakupe, and the first ever Tibetan settlement in India came into existence in 1961. These days it's become a very popular tourist attraction, mostly because it's a place in India that doesn't really feel like India, and their temples are, of course, out of this world stunning. The Golden Temple really is very, very beautiful inside. I mean, I mean, look at it. It's, uh, it's certainly one of the coolest temples I've ever been in. However, there's 10,000 tourists in here. 
who felt a little uneasy surrounded by that many selfie sticks. So we left the touristy areas of Bilakup and decided to explore. Just chilling here on a regular road in the Tibetan settlement, except they have this. <laughs> This massive, massive tree, bro! Literally in the middle of the road. Insane! Eventually, I made friends with a really cool local restaurant owner called Wang Li, who introduced me to many different Tibetan dishes, some of which included beef. Because apparently, Karnataka is one of the very few states in India that allow people to cook beef. Still hardly believing that one could actually eat okay. beef in India, we crossed the hectic local traffic and continued our motorbike trip into the beautiful mountains of South India. It feels so good to finally be here in the mountains of South India. I mean, the views all around us are incredible. All the mountain villages, the forests, the rivers, the, 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 the rock formations and stuff, they're just amazing. Um, I've literally been dreaming of these places for the longest of time and, and now we're finally here. The next morning we woke up at 4 a.m. and rode for well over an hour to the very top of one of the most beautiful places of our entire trip where we sat on a tall mountain and certainly took our time enjoying the calming views all around us. Uh, tonight I slept for four hours to get to see these views and even though I am a little bit tired right now but <laughs> it's been so 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 worth it it's crazy i mean look at the views all around us they're insane the the, the clouds the sun the hills the, the the trees no people whatsoever it's uh it's incredible i think this is probably one of the most beautiful places we've seen in india thus far for sure Later that morning, we excitedly hopped back on our bikes, taking on the gorgeous country roads of South India, until we reached the world-famous state called Goa. Uh, right now, we're trying to find this really remote, uh, very, very beautiful beach uh, somewhere here in the jungle. Uh, I think it's it's that way, so, uh, so we'll just head down and, and, and see where life takes us. It certainly wasn't very easy to find the beach, but when we finally saw how it looked, it made it all worth it. I mean, look at this place. I guess all I can say is welcome to Goa. <laughs> Yesterday when we came to this beach for lunch, the only thing we could say was, wow. <laughs> and so we decided to stay here doing absolutely nothing, just chilling, reading books and whatnot. Uh, 24 hours later, we're still here admiring the beautiful, beautiful sunset, right there. Yes, our days in Goa were certainly as relaxing as they might look. Great food, friendly local people, remote white sand beaches, and next level epic sunsets. As much as we enjoyed our time on those beautiful secluded beaches though, we were really running out of time at this point and thus left just a day later. Goa is obviously uh, famous for tons of different things, but one of them is abandoned forts that were built by colonialists back in the day. This is just the very fort we are visiting and uh, the views are insane. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. This is just one side of the fort. If you go down there, you can go all the way up the hill, on the wall, see some other epic views here. You can descend to a gorgeous, gorgeous beach. Right there, they have uh, some more epic views, a church, and uh, just incredible. We're in the middle of this amazing jungle, surrounded by next level epic views on this abandoned, uh, pretty good looking wall. And there's no people, of course, because everyone's on the beach. Then we went on to explore even more parts of Goa. And to be completely honest with you, it almost felt like being in Portugal. You see, even though Goa's history dates back to a very long time ago, in the early 16th century, the Portuguese defeated the ruling Bijapur Sultan and set up a permanent settlement in Goa. This was the beginning of foreign rule that lasted for four and a half centuries until its annexation in 1961. 
but still to this day you can see loads of Portuguese colonial buildings, the most important of which are the grand churches everywhere you go. Man, these churches here in Goa really do take me back all the way to Portugal. They look very European, I guess, and exactly the same way they look there. Uh, it's very, very peaceful in here, hardly not too many people. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really interesting time machine experience. <laughs> Yeah, go really did feel like a very interesting time machine that took me so many years back in time. I mean, look at it. However, as you might guess, most Europeans who come to India don't necessarily want to find European sites or experiences, and we were no different. So we hopped back on our bikes and rode right back inside the gorgeous, lush mountains of central India. To be completely honest with you, I, I really enjoyed my time in Goa. I mean, it was, <clears throat> I think, one of, the, one of the coolest states we visited so far in India. That being said, it feels really good to be back in the mountains because finally, I'm not sweating anymore all the time. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's chilly. It's, um, it's really nice. I don't know about yourself, but every time I'm in the mountains, I get this overwhelming sense of freedom and happiness as I get to disconnect big time, except... Continue straight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For the next few days, we continued riding across mountains, villages, traffic jams, beautiful bridges, and dense forests until we finally reached one of the most popular hill stations in all of India that I loved to the moon and back, called Mahabalashvar. It's a really beautiful area in the state of Maharashtra that's also home to one of the very few evergreen forests of India, as well as a gorgeous canyon. Man, this hill station is really amazing. So uh, when we were down south, we wanted to visit a couple of different hill stations. Didn't have the time, but I'm really happy we came here because um, the views around this area and all the things you can do here are just insane. Uh, the weather is amazing. There's a lot of nature, a lot of wildlife. The strawberries are great, uh, they even have strawberry wine here. <laughs> and uh, I mean, look at the views, look at all these viewpoints and all the hills and the mountains and the jungles and whatnot. So I'm really, really happy we're here. It feels so relaxing, so, so wonderful. Uh, hill stations for the win. Another thing that was really spectacular about Mahabaleshwar was their remote viewpoints that take a long time to reach. Look at this place! <laughs> Apparently we are surrounded by billions of trees all around and uh, there's the canyon right here. And absolutely no people whatsoever, it's amazing! Not only that, their roads were also spectacularly beautiful. We just stopped uh, literally by the side of the road to admire the views um, and the views are insane. <laughs> In India, this is just a regular uh, road, uh, a regular view, nothing special, but, but to me, it's, it's incredible. Eventually though, the gorgeous mountain roads turned into large highways packed with traffic and we found ourselves in India's richest city, the one and only Mumbai. Um, this morning we woke up at 5 a.m. Uh, so that we could go to the biggest fish market in all of Mumbai where they have sharks, swordfish and a billion other kinds of fish. Uh, right now we're gonna hop on some bikes and uh, hopefully make it in time. Welcome to the Sassoon Docks, one of the oldest and largest docks in all of Mumbai that comes alive every morning with thousands of people buying and selling all kinds of fish and seafood. Dude, there's a billion people in this market, it's crazy. Everyone shouting, buying things, selling things. There's dozens of boats surrounding us. They're literally uh, throwing the fish onto the dock and people are selling it right here. Quite often there's there's families doing it. The, the men are fishing, the women are, are selling it, pushing me around. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. 
We spent the next few days exploring various places around Mumbai with my local friends, which apparently was loads of fun. We're currently at one of the most famous sites in all of Mumbai, the Gateway of India. Chirag! How What's does up? it feel, bro? It feels amazing. How do you feel? Because it's my... I mean, I live here, so it's nothing different for me, but how do you feel? I feel amazing. <laughs> I know you might not believe this, but it turns out that the world's most expensive house is here in Mumbai, right that building. This large skyscraper is built for a family of four people. It costs two billion dollars and they have 650 servants serving them every single day. It's insane. What made this place even more insane was the fact that just a day later, I helped a few wonderful Indian students organize an amazing cleaning campaign in the local slums where people live in tiny huts along a terribly dirty railway track with goats and hens roaming around. The campaign went incredibly well and I was very, very happy and proud of the girls who organized everything, but I couldn't stop thinking about the huge contrasts that were so apparent in this Indian city of dreams. The following day, we ended up participating in India's most famous annual festival called Holi, where everyone goes completely crazy and dances like there's no tomorrow. Which, of course, made me very, very happy. As you can see, the colors didn't necessarily wash away, but why would I care when I've just had the best party of my entire life in my favorite city in India? And so we once again loved the city life and felt free and alive, riding on tiny, gorgeous country roads while admiring the magnificent views all around us. We just came to the best hotel of our entire trip. You know why? Because it's not a hotel. It's a place called Asham, a place where they host people completely for free, they feed people completely for free, generally either travelers or people who don't have you know, any other place to stay and stuff. And this was organized by, by a friend of ours from, from Mumbai and it's everywhere, it's so nice. We have these two beds, a beautiful room, uh, unlimited amount of food, uh, obviously hot water, cold water, everything, and uh, yeah, life is beautiful. I'm so tired after that one week in Mumbai. Get up. <laughs> Jacob, we need to eat. Oh, please. Please. <laughs> Fast. Fast. <laughs> 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 really not hungry. He's <laughs> <laughs> forcing us to have some food now. <laughs> I come tomorrow breakfast. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, please. Come on, man. Please. Take very little. Okay. Please. Please, please, Jake. Please. This is amazing. The hospitality is so amazing. Maybe it's even too much for my taste. <laughs> Man, I think right now I'm the most tired throughout the whole trip and I got woken up for some food that I don't want to eat. But everyone's really friendly here. <laughs> and we're literally inside a temple. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> We live inside a temple, and we're about to eat inside the temple. Beautiful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>
ठीक है 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 ऑन स्लीप नो स्लीप नो स्लीप योर कंपनी अमेरिका लंडन इंडिया पाकिस्तान कुमार प्रधान है पाकिस्तान बदबू गुड पर्सन पाकिस्तान बदबू पर्सन so apparently the dinner is over uh, master yoda is taking our plates back to the kitchen he was so friendly it's insane wow that being said i'm ready to hit the bed welcome to nashik india's wine capital that had such beautiful views it blew our minds So it's already been a couple of days since we left Mumbai and to be completely honest with you the rides suck <laughs> it's so incredibly hot around 40 degrees Celsius every single day we spend so much time driving on these roads a lot of the roads are, are highways with tons of tracks and, uh, and a lot of action not much to see really Andrukas has fever, I almost have fever as well, and uh, we're so exhausted after having driven literally all around India now. It's the last leg of the trip, so we're, we're trying to keep it together, but it's really hard. It's really hard. I keep drinking as much water as I can. We just ordered some sugarcane juice. Oh, it's coming. To get some much needed sugar, but yeah. Uh, but yeah. It's not the easiest. The, the juice is really good. We obviously weren't going to let no heat or traffic or anything else stop us and thus continue trudging forward bit by bit, meter by meter, kilometer by kilometer, until we finally reached the world's largest statue that's 182 meters tall. What? Look at the size of that thing. Yeah, now the size of this statue really was completely spectacular. I mean, I had seen quite a few statues in my life, but nothing as grand as this. I mean, just look at it. From here, we cannot really see the, the top of the statue. We cannot see anything above his left hand because it's just so big. The Statue of Unity is a colossal statue of Indian statesman and independence activist, Sardar Balabhai Patel was the first Home Minister of Independent India and highly respected for his leadership in uniting the 562 princely states of India to form the single Union of India without any armed conflict. The statue was first announced in 2010 and built just a few years later for a staggering amount of 420 million US dollars. Later the same night, we went deep into the heart of the state of Gujarat and found ourselves exploring a gorgeous ancient stepwell called Adalaj. It is so hot and we're so exhausted that we keep stopping every 10 to 15 minutes or so just by the highway to chill for a bit. Uh, yes, yes. How it looks right there. <laughs> How are you feeling, bro? Man, I'm super tired. Yeah? Yeah. All this traffic, all this beeping. I have to agree, the, the beeping is not the best, though. Yeah. And I'm feeling sick again. To be completely honest with you, it is kind of difficult to find proper food uh, here on these roads. We had diarrhea three times throughout the whole trip. Now seems to be the worst. <laughs> At this point, it certainly wasn't the easiest task to deal with all the tiny obstacles of adventurous travel. 
but we had just over a week left and wanted to make the most of it. So we trudged onwards. Yesterday, we visited our very first step well here in India and we were completely amazed by how beautiful it was. So today, we came to the most famous step well in all of Gujarat and uh, this place looks even better. It looks so old, so well preserved. All the statues, all the, all the columns, all the everything, all the steps right here. Just incredible. Um, absolutely can't wait to explore. Enter the world famous Rani Kebab step wall that was built a thousand years ago by another widowed queen and is a well-known UNESCO World Heritage Site that attracts thousands of tourists from around the world. In the past, the step wall was completely flooded by a nearby river, but it still retained over 500 intricate statues and is so well preserved that it's even been named the cleanest iconic place in India, which made me really happy. If you've never been to India, it's probably very hard for you to understand, but 99.99% uh, .99 of the time, everything is incredibly busy here. There's, there's all the beeping, all the noise, uh, a lot of, you know, dust, and, uh, and, and, and it's obviously very, very hot as well. So, so you get, um, hmm, what's the word? You feel as if you're a little overwhelmed most of the time, especially when you're riding bikes and going to tiny places and there's so many people who want to talk to you and stuff. So every time you go to a really calm and peaceful place, just like this one, where everything's super clean, you can hear the, the sounds of nature, you can hear the birds and stuff, you just get this overwhelming sense of happiness, I guess. Because the contrast is just so, so big. Our bikes are there, the street is there. Once we hit the street, it's gonna be beep, 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 ah! You know what I mean? And here, it's... Feeling happy and peaceful, we hit the road again, finally entering the large deserts of North India. It is exactly 12 a.m. at night. We just did our longest ride of 450 kilometers, I think. And we're so exhausted. It's crazy. <laughs> Oh. Oh. The next morning we woke up in the ancient desert town of Jaisalmer, that's a popular UNESCO World Heritage Site, also known as the Golden City of India. The town lies in the heart of the Thar Desert, which makes the climate incredibly hot and quite different from most other areas of North India. Its crown jewel is the Jaisalmer Fort, which is one of the very few living forts in the world, as nearly one-fourth of the old city's population still resides within the fort. We're currently sitting at a random rooftop cafe here in Jaisalmer's fort, and uh, uh, I have to say it's a pretty incredible sight. There's hardly any people now because it's the low season, and we can see literally the whole city all around us. The fort has just been lighted up, and uh, and it's an amazing place. We spent our evening enjoying the relative calm of this tiny Indian town and the next morning left for the desert that's right at the border with Pakistan. Time to get on the jeep. Okay my friend, we wish you a good trip. Enjoy please, see you tomorrow. So apparently the, the ride is over. We just came to the, to the uh, camel camp and it's time to get on one of those camels. To be completely honest with you, I feel really bad about riding a camel, but apparently there's no other way to get to the camp we're going to. And it seems like these camels are so big and strong. Hopefully they're not gonna mind too much. Whoa. <laughs> it's so big. The camel ride took well over an hour and even though it certainly was an interesting experience that took me thousands of years back in time, quite unexpectedly, it was also one of the most painful things I had ever done. <laughs> my legs, dude! Ah. Ah, I can't feel my legs. The ride is finally over. Honestly, it was the most painful experience of my life. Still can't feel my legs, especially these parts. Oh my goodness. Ah, 
my butt hurts, my legs hurt. Crap! It was really uncomfortable and as I said I'm feeling really bad that I had to take the camel because they told us you gotta take a jeep there but look there's a jeep in our camp come on I feel even worse now the camels went right into demonstrating to us their amazing sandbathing techniques while our local Bedouin guides got busy preparing the dinner and all the rest of us were making friends and feeling super happy to be where we were It's already completely dark and uh, and there are billions and billions and billions and billions of stars in the sky. I really wish you could be here as well to see them because it's, it's insane. We're so far from any kind of civilization. We're so remote and this view is just incredible. The next morning we woke up at 7 a.m., had a quick breakfast and went back to our bikes as fast as we could since our flights from Delhi were leaving in just four days and we literally were running the risk of missing them as we were still over a thousand kilometers away. The next morning we entered one of India's largest forts called Mehrangar that was built in the 15th century and stands right above the city of Jodhpur. The fort is so big that inside its boundaries there are several palaces known for their intricate carvings and expansive courtyards. As you might already know, I'm not the biggest fan of visiting museums and touristy sites like that, but to be completely honest with you, this place, this fort, is, is really cool. There are tons of different rooms with a lot of expositions and, and all of them are really interesting. Uh, you can go through them very, very quickly. Uh, they're not boring, they're uh, very informative as well. And, uh, and I really like, I mean, the fort itself is also massive. Uh, you can see literally the whole town around it. Um, thousands of uh, blue buildings, that's what they call Jodhpur, the blue city and stuff. It's, uh, it's a good place, good place, good place. Uh, um, Tomorrow is our last day, so we're still trying to make the most of our trip, and so far, it's working out. I like it. Turns out that the fort's museum is apparently one of the most well-stocked museums in the state of Rajasthan, featuring palanquins, costumes, weapons, and lots of artwork. They were already celebrating Holi hundreds of years ago. Look, in 1810, at the very beginning of the 19th century, this guy was already having processions with elephants, horses, and millions and millions of colors with thousands of people who participating. Yeah. Incredible! Even the elephant is painted. Good stuff, good stuff, bro. We spent well over an hour walking all around the fort, discovering new interesting things to see every step of the way, and went right inside Jaipur, one of the most touristy places in all of India that features a couple of UNESCO World Heritage Sites in its own right, such as this fort at the top of the city. I honestly cannot believe I'm saying this, but it's been exactly 42 days or six weeks since we rented those motorbikes up in New Delhi. Um, and right now it's apparently the very last night of the trip because tomorrow the trip is over uh, as we'll finally reach Delhi and give back the bikes. Um, so now I'm sitting on this ancient fort here in the beautiful city of Jaipur overlooking the whole city on this mountain top with a next level beautiful sunset right there. And uh, it feels amazing, it feels amazing. It feels unreal in a way. I honestly I can't believe that the trip is about to end and uh, pfft, so many things have happened. I, I I feel like me and that bike are one now. You know what I mean? It's uh, yeah. Spending my last evening of that trip at the top of this mountain, I remember feeling totally in the moment, free, alive, and very grateful for everything that had already happened throughout the trip. As incredibly beautiful as the sunset was, though, surprising it wasn't our last. You see, the next morning we once again hopped on our motorbikes, riding towards New Delhi as fast as we could but also making the absolute most of our last day of the trip by stopping every time we found something interesting to see. Last day of our motorbike trip here in India and we came to our third and final step well, which, to be completely honest with you, looks beautiful. Though, unfortunately, you cannot go down the steps, but uh, you can look at them. <laughs> as beautiful as the step well was, it was nothing compared to what happened next. We rode into some mountains in the metropolitan area of New Delhi where we stumbled upon a temple filled with dozens of friendly deer and then continued riding up the hill 
until we entered certainly the coolest fort throughout the whole trip that apparently we didn't even know existed. We were on our way to visit a temple which we thought was the Rat Temple. Turns out it's the Deer Temple. And then there was a, a fortress on the hill that we saw. We never knew this place existed, but we thought, well, we're already here, so, so let's go check it out. And this place turned out to be <laughs> definitely one of the best places I've, I've seen in India throughout the whole trip. Wow, I mean, there's absolutely no people in here. It's incredibly beautiful, very, very peaceful, very calm, very relaxed. The views around us are insane. We're, we're in these mountains, there's all the forests, a large city in the background. It's, I'm incredibly happy. This is the last place we're visiting. Yes, I certainly didn't over-exaggerate the beauty of this place. It's a semi-abandoned fortress not too far from New Delhi that's kind of hard to reach and thus rarely visited by tourists. But the sites inside the fort and around it are simply out of this world study, especially during the golden hour, which is when we happen to visit the fort. I honestly still cannot believe we randomly stumbled upon this place. And I think the reason it's so incredible for me is that um, the major thing I miss being in India is, is peace and quiet. Because you know, there's, there's so many things happening and it's, it's so busy quite, quite, quite often. You just, just get bombarded with, with things all around you. And, and this place, it's, it's so peaceful and quiet. It's incredible. The only thing I can hear right now is the chirping of the birds and the wind. is the, the, the most perfect place to end the trip with. So happy right now, so happy. The Great Wall of India, the sunset, the mountains, an amazing fortress, wow. We spend the next few hours riding the very busy highways of India, right inside the country's capital, New Delhi, where we gave back the bikes and, even though we still couldn't believe it, ended our 43 days long motorbike trip around India. The trip is finally over. It's crazy. We just gave back the bikes. Uh, I feel a little emotional because the bike was, was like my best friend for the last six weeks and stuff. But, uh, but I'm ready, I'm ready to call it uh, a day, I think. <laughs> Look at my hands. <laughs> Look at my shirt, there's, there is, there's insect blood and sand and, and whatnot. Man, it's been a crazy trip, super challenging, but very exciting as well. If you, if you, if you ever think you wanna test your patience and perseverance and, uh, and stamina, do a motorbike trip in India. <laughs> It'll test your limits would be very rewarding as well. Oh, I think I'm ready to go sleep for three days straight and uh, see where life takes me next. <laughs> yes, this motorbike trip truly was one of the most challenging adventures I had ever been on. My filmmaker and I ended up riding exactly 8,000 kilometers across a large part of India, all the while exploring hundreds of awe-inspiring places and learning loads about the local cultures. As exciting as this trip was though, we very often found ourselves in really stressful situations almost every single day. From the heat being unbearable to our stomachs refusing to work to us getting completely covered in sand while riding on dirt roads and lots more. However, I think this is exactly why traveling in India is so exciting. It really does test your limits and puts you into more challenging situations than most countries ever will. That is why I love visiting this gorgeous country and why I'll certainly be back in the future. Thank you for everything you taught me, India, and I can't wait to meet you again.